So, as, uh, as Dustin said, um, uh, though I teach in the politics department, I'm, uh, you know, probably more of what uh, people would consider an intellectual historian or a historian of political thought. So, uh, I'm just going to kind of talk to you about a historical figure who's of some interest to me. So, if nothing else, uh, hopefully you'll come away, um, you know, having learned something about somebody about whom you probably didn't know much before. All right. So, um... Yeah, so objections to liberalism, uh, I think, abound of late, and two themes are often heard. Uh, when one hears populists or post-liberals or the generally disaffected denounce liberalism, it's often for being anti-democratic and or imperial. Liberals, critics claim, have been revealed as upholders of an elite that will adopt what, whatever tool is at hand to stymie the popular will when the latter threatens their perks or their expansive conception of rights. Equally, liberals have shown themselves devoted at all costs, they claim, to maintain hegemony abroad in ways that make it impossible for other peoples to determine their own collective futures. Today, these criticisms are presented largely as failures of liberals to live up to their professed ideals, as exposures of liberal hypocrisy. For with democracy, what the political theorist John Donne calls the public cant of the modern world, and with open imperialism, of course, discredited. Even sidelining majority preferences at home or maintaining global dominance uh, must be framed as protecting democracy or combating <coughs> imperialism. But it was not always the case. Liberalism's monolithic self-positioning on the side of democracy and anti-imperialism is a very recent arrival. It's something that occurred in the 20th century and really something that occurred after World War II. Amidst present discontents, then, it may be useful to step back and consider the liberal sensibility as manifested in an earlier area. And that's what I'll try to do today through uh, analyzing this particular fellow, the Victorian uh, jurist, historian, and political commentator, James Fitzjames Stephen. Uh, so, Stephen is not a household name today, but he was a major player in the public life of what was, in his lifetime, the world's most liberal nation and its most powerful empire. Although he did not expound in the manner of uh, the great thinkers, a systematic political philosophy, I think that fact actually makes him, in some ways, a more useful uh, prism onto his age. Because he was not, first and foremost, uh, concerned with constructing a timeless system, he really reflects pretty well some of the major presuppositions and sentiments of his own time. And one area where those presuppositions overlap with ours is that especially in the last couple decades of his life, Stephen feared that liberalism had entered a crisis. But, and this is what's interesting, Stephen's outlook decisively differed from our own. When he fretted about liberalism's decline, he did so from a position that was avowedly anti-democratic and pro-imperial. So he's someone who is all at once a liberal, an opponent of democracy, and a proponent of empire. So who is this guy? James Fitzjames Stephen incarnated what one historian dubbed the intellectual aristocracy. That is, the stratum of interrelated members of the knowledge classes who gave direction to Victorian morality, literature, and policy, and whose prestige was anchored in what he called a high regard for solid intellectual accomplishment. Stephen was born in 1829, eight years before uh, Victoria ascended the throne, as you see here. His life, therefore, was nearly coextensive with the famous time that we call the Victorian era. The decades leading up to the coronation of Queen Victoria, seen here, were a time of intense religiosity. This is the period that in the US we call the Second Great Awakening, and there was a parallel fervor in the United Kingdom. Fitzjames was born to a family at the very center of this evangelical revival that was transforming English life across the first third of the 19th century. One of his grandfathers, James Stephen, had been a lawyer, member of parliament, an author of abolitionist tracts, and lead draftsman of the 1807 act that abolished the slave trade throughout the British Empire. His father, another James Stephen, uh, cut so important a figure in the administrative state that he earned the moniker Oversecretary of the Colonies. That was a play on his official title, which was Colonial Undersecretary. And he was sometimes referred to as the true ruler of the empire. This James Stephen carried on the family legacy by, by composing the bill to end slavery in the colonies, 
and he did much to develop the legal framework for colonial self-government. He was also an important writer, and he penned uh, several books. Like many notable British writers of the century, he combined a vigorous authorial regimen with high professional office, something that uh, his eldest son, um, well, actually, James Fitchin, too, was not his eldest son, he was his second son, uh, would also do. So this James Stephen, uh, James Fitchin, Stephen's father, was uh, as proud of the literary side of his life as the administrative side, which is perhaps surprising to us now, given that I really don't think probably more than 10 people have read a single word he wrote in the last 50 years at least, um, even though his work in government enduringly shaped the modern world. Nonetheless, he wrote to his son James Fitzjames when the latter was trying to sort out his life as a young man. He wrote, quote, there was a time when I enjoyed a repute as a writer of the Ed of Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh Reviews, this is a journal associated with uh, the Whig Party, what we would now call moderate liberalism, and probably the most influential journal of the day, something like uh, the Atlantic uh, of its time. And he continues, and from the bottom of my heart, I hope that you will eclipse me even more than the elder mill has been eclipsed by the younger. The two mills that he was alluding to, as uh, many of you probably know, were James Mill, this fellow here, uh, the radical theorist and activist whose history of British India offered the classic utilitarian justification for British rule of India, and his eldest son, John Stuart, um, who would become Victorian England's uh, greatest philosopher, leading public intellectual, and to this day, to a lot of people at least, the archetypal liberal mind. In any case, as you can see, this was a family with extremely high expectations. His tiger father, so to speak, expected him to be both a great writer and to conduct a splendid career in one of the major institutions, like the civil service, the law, or, or the church. Now, ultimately, Fitzjames uh, decided on the law, and his legal career was very noteworthy. As a barrister, he was involved in a number of high-profile cases. One uh, that's especially interesting was called uh, the sort of scandal of the Seven Against Christ, he was a defendant for uh, a few, um, uh, uh, he was the uh, lawyer for a few of the defendants in that case. This was a book that um, aspired to develop a kind of rational and historically informed Christianity, and the authors who were clergymen in the Church of England, um, a couple of them were brought up on trial for heresy for the views expressed there. And uh, Stephen was one of the many barristers involved in their defense. Uh, his legal expertise gained him admission as well to a number of uh, important commissions and sort of quasi-political bodies of note. Importantly, he was on a committee on education that had some lasting effects in the making of uh, the British education system. And on that committee, um, Matthew Arnold, who some of you might have heard of, who was a great poet and critic, uh, Arnold also sat. And he would wind up his career as a high court judge. He's being spoofed here uh, at the end. Uh, toward the end of his life. Most importantly of all, he would serve a stint as a legislator for the subcontinent, as it was called, officially law member of the Council of the Viceroy of India. So this is an important position. Basically, he's a part of a very small group who govern India on the spot for the East India Company, and therefore ultimately for Britain. In a short time, Stephen remained considerable portions of Indian law and did so to lasting effect. The impact of India on his thought was significant, not so much for implanting wholly new ideas uh, in his mind as for deepening the grooves in which his mind already ran, such as uh, increasing his impatience with parliamentary government. It was, for instance, a standing source of frustration to Fitzjames that India, in his mind, benefited from a more rational legal system than did his homeland, since his project for codifying and rationalizing parts of the English common law repeatedly met with failure in the House of Commons. While experience in, in imperial administration was shared by many Victorian intellectuals, it was felt by Stephen's peers to have marked him more than it did others. Particularly to this experience was attributed an aggravation of his truly brutal intellectual demeanor. He was called in his life a Philistine, a Goliath, a bully, and by his own brother, quote, an elephant trampling through a flower garden. His time on the Indian Council, most of all, I think, intensified his hatred for what he called a decadent sen uh, sentimentalism, 
which he claimed had rendered his country incapable of facing up to hard truths. He himself captured the imprint of Indian service on his mind in striking ways, as when he boasted to a correspondent who was a devout religious believer that his time in India had made him sympathize with Pontius Pilate, who had been, he claimed, just like him. He was a government house apparatchik stationed in a backward land, here, Palestine, is being equated to India, and doing his best as the emissary of a superior polity, again, the Roman Empire is now like the British Empire, and just trying to keep order and bring improvements, as they saw it, to a place characterized by economic hardship and very strange religious movements. You know, that's how Stephen King to think of himself, and it gives you something of a taste, the kind of person he was, that he would write to this uh, very believing Christian that he had now come to see himself as like Pontius Pilate, and to mean that in a good way. Amazingly, though, for all of that arduous legal work, his father's wish for his son's literary success, I think, was fulfilled. For Fitzjames, great passion was writing. He wrote um, double-digit books, and uh, even more than that, he was kind of a compulsive writer for the newspaper and journal press. He wrote over a thousand articles in an eight-year period for just one of the outlets to which he regularly contributed. I mean, I think you can say that he was a truly he was kind of OCD about writing. Stephen left his greatest mark as an analyst and historian of the law, but he also commented extensively on religion, politics, and literature. Among other spicy verdicts, he claimed that Dickens uh, was just a shallow uh, writer of melodrama. No subject was beyond his remit, as he saw it. It was the job of him and, and his ilk to educate the rising middle classes about the social and ideological trends of the day. And while despite this extraordinary output, Fitzjames on his own uh, did not surpass John Stuart Mill in importance, hardly anyone could have, when one brings into view Fitzjames's relations, we can fairly say that his father did get the better of James Mill in the cumulative literary impact of his project. For Fitzjames's brother was this guy, Leslie Stephen, who was a very influential uh, uh, historian and literary critic, and Leslie's daughter was Virginia Woolf. Uh, the, you know, one of the three or four most important novelists of the 20th century. So she was Fitzjames Stevens' niece. If we throw in uh, that Albert Van Dicey, who was the uh, foremost writer on constitutional law in English history, um, was also Fitzjames' cousin, and thus another one of James Stevens' grandsons, you might say that this was not a bad record for a man who wanted his descendants to rank high in the world of letters got to be one of the most accomplished families in you know, the history of world literature. All right, now to get down to brass tacks, in political theory, Fitzjames Stephen is best known, if he's known at all, as an adversary of John Stuart Mill, the aforementioned liberal philosopher. Stephen's uh, most widely read work of political thought was Liberty, Equality, Fraternity of 1873 and it named a number of blows at England's then most famous philosopher who embodied the hopes of advanced liberalism, as it was then called. Fitzjames began writing Liberty, Equality, Fraternity on the boat back from India. So anxious was he to apply the lessons that he learned there against what he saw as radicals in his own country who had erected the credo of the French Revolution into a religious state. So anyway, while the book is far less read now than uh, Mill's great works, like On Liberty or the Subjection of Women, at the time the book made um, a considerable splash. It earned praise from uh, many, including Mill's most brilliant successor as a utilitarian philosopher, Henry Sidgwick, who actually claimed that Stephen got the better of Mill in many regards. Less tastefully, one fan joked that Stephen's critique was so powerful that it had literally killed Mill who died just a few months after this book's publication. Uh, it didn't. Mill um, never responded to liberty, equality, fraternity formally, but uh, from what we can gather from his interlocutors, uh, Mill was not very impressed, and actually Mill died of an infection he got from hiking in foul weather. But nonetheless, the chronology lent itself to some mean-spirited remarks. Uh, that's really cancel culture for you, if you want to say. Uh, all right. Because Stephen authored this uh, sort of vigorous rebuttal to Mill, scholars have, um, insofar as they've attended to Stephen, have placed him in the conservative camp. 
Now, of course, conservatives uh, are entitled to claim any past thinker as their own, should they wish. And modern, uh, modern interpreters find that past thinkers chime with contemporary schools of thought in ways that these thinkers never could have anticipated. No one, um, you know, no one thinks you're totally bound by what people in the past, uh, how they describe themselves. And undoubtedly, I think, as we'll see, some of Stephen's views sound quite right-wing today. But this classification of Stephen as a conservative is on the whole misleading. Stephen um, was incredibly contemptuous toward partisan conservatism. He was a free trader and a free marketeer, positions dearer to liberalism than conservatism in Stephen's time. And he dissented from core articles of what we would now consider the Burkean conservative worldview. For example, Stephen did not see prejudice as a source of embedded wisdom. He did not value tradition or inherited custom as such. He did not believe the landed nobility was a specially beneficent class. He was ambivalent about the political effects of organized religion, and by the end of his life he was openly skeptical of the social and moral value of Christianity. And Stephen was favorable to the French Revolution on the grounds that uh, the Ancien Regime, which had existed before the Revolution, was genuinely oppressive to all but the privileged classes. So all of this stuff that we often associate with uh, conservatism, at least through Burke, an emphasis on the non-rational sources of allegiance, a desire to sanctify civil society, uh, to quote Burke, to guard an aesthetic attachment grounded in the loveliness of the country and an esteem for persons who could embody institutions, this is Burke speaking, so as to create in us love, veneration, and admiration. All of this stuff that Burke made central to the idea of a gentlemanly and chivalrous aristocratic order, Stephen had no time for any of that. Um, and in this, in fact, his master was much more Jeremy Bentham, which some of you may know, the eccentric, curmudgeonly philosopher reformer who had sought to amend every single aspect of social life in accordance with the standard of utility. And Fitzjames Stephen thought of himself in that vein as a defender of what he called the hard, old utilitarian point of view against indulgent and emotional movements that he thought were gaining steam. In short, we see in Stephen the sort of self-confident ratiocination of the professional and the administrator, and not the reverent regard for a consecrated order of the temperamental conservative. Indeed, Stephen was considered, and considered himself to belong, as I gestured at before, within the liberal mainstream. Upon returning from India, he stood unsuccessfully for Parliament as a liberal. This candidacy occurred pregnantly in the same year that he launched the first effective attack on Mill's pontifical authority, as one of Mill's disciples put it. And this conjunction, I think, can sometimes confuse us, because uh, modern readers sort of refuse to take seriously Stephen's professions that, even if he attacked John Stuart Mill, nonetheless, he was as he said, on the live questions of the day, fully in accord with the practice of modern liberals. That's what Stephen said. He only objected to some of their underlying assumptions and impulses, especially those that he saw motivating a more extreme um, elements of the liberal coalition. Liberalism was a word, he wrote uh, in the 1860s, which has had so great a charm for a whole generation, himself included. Later in life, um, he became increasingly, this is in the, the 1880s, uh, increasingly sort of disgusted with organized liberalism. Nonetheless, he conceived of the distancing um, from the sort of institutional liberal party. He conceived of it as him staying true to the liberalism of his youth. He had not changed, he claimed, but liberalism had been taken over by, quote, Jacobins and socialists. By the time of his death in 1894, his pessimism about the prospects for British political culture had become truly overwhelming. Anyway, Stephen, as one French translator put it, had, quote, a very liberal mind, possessed of modern ideas, but one that recoiled at the difficulty and danger of attempts at unlimited and absolute extension of the ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity. So Stephen's, you know, liberalism did not involve what was seen as the excesses of that French revolutionary credo, but it did involve um, certain specific articles that are still important to liberalism uh, all the way through its history, such as the possession of private property, right, protection of private property, rationalization of the legal and administrative system, and equality before the law. 
which as we'll see to Stephen and to many other liberals of the time, implied nothing about having equal votes. It was also though, and most generally I think, for Stephen, liberalism was a commitment to the application of reason to politics for the sake of moderate reform. And as a result, it was a commitment to the leadership of that social group which was most reasonable, namely knowledge workers and professionals like himself. So technocracy is a word uh, a coinage from a couple generations later, but Stephen, I think we can say, identified true liberalism, as he called it, with the idea that that word now conveys, and he accepted without compunction the sociologically inegalitarian implications about the distribution of power that would follow from that. As Stephen put it, um, we're going to start to I'm going to start to quote from him uh, quite a bit to give you a sort of flavor for him. You'll see that he has a very direct style. As Stephen put it, quote, those only are entitled to the description of liberals who recognize the claims of thought and learning and of those enlarged views of men and institutions which are derived from them to a permanent predominating influence in all the great affairs of life. This rightful hegemony of the thoughtful and the learned blended, in his eyes at least, blended an older gentlemanly idea of uh, ideal of members of the highly propertied classes who possessed a liberal arts education and were thus immune to you know, the worries about material necessity. Um, it involved granting them political leadership, and on the other, it involved what we might say a more modern conception of the expert. A worrisome aspect of Victorian civic attitudes, he claimed, was the underrating of the importance of special knowledge. The number of people he cataloged able to carry on anything like a systematic train of thought or to grasp the bearings of any subject consisting of several parts is exceedingly small. The work of governing a great nation requires an immense amount of special knowledge and the steady, restrained, and calm exertion of a great variety of the very best talents which are to be found in it. The demands of all this work, he claimed, made his age emphatically the age for special knowledge and study, the age for engineers, men of science, lawyers, and the like." End quote. So only by better incorporating into statecraft these sorts of intellectual virtues and abilities could politics redeem, be redeemed from what he called its perfectly disgusting condition. So this is a very gruff elitism, as you can see, and he aimed um, this critique really at two principal sets of enemies. The first and most obvious were democratizers. Stephen predicted several specific horrors to come from the rise um, of democracy in his home country, but more than the specific things he worried about, he had a sort of general point to make, which was the incapacity, intellectual and moral, of the masses for political rights. And it's interesting that he's making this, this um, critique at a time when Victorian England is not at all a democracy. So um, in Stephen's main period of his writing, even after uh, successive expansions of the franchise, they're still very, very far from universal suffrage. So this is not America that he's writing. Nonetheless, Stephen's outlook was very dour. Uh, he held that democracy's arrival might be inevitable, but nonetheless he was determined to fight it. He said, quote, the waters of democracy are out and no human force can turn them back, but I do not see why, as we go with the stream, we need to sing hallelujah to the river god. Since it was evident, he said, that, that, quote, the minority are wise and the majority foolish, the only fit conclusion was that, quote, the wise minority are the rightful masters of the foolish majority. Democracy, on the other hand, effaced this very distinction between wisdom and folly. It rested on the presumption that, quote again, mediocrity, impudence, and rudeness were entitled to a say in public affairs equal to that of intellect and expertise. All of this democracy stuff, he said, had nothing to do with liberalism properly understood, which was about finding a way for reason to tell on the direction of government against ignorance, passion, habit, custom, and all the other irrational forces that tended to prevail in human life. Stephen's friend and predecessor in the role of legislator of India uh, encapsulated their case quite well. This figure, Henry Mayne, wrote, democracy would result in a dead level of ultra-conservatism 
that the establishment of the masses in power is a blackest omen for all legislation founded on scientific opinion. That's uh, to quote uh, Henry May. And according to Fitzjames Stephen, uh, echoing this thought, the highest function that the great, which the great mass of mankind could ever be fitted to perform would be that of recognizing the moral and intellectual superiority of the few, and of following their guidance, not slavishly, but willingly, and with an intelligent cooperation. Interesting sort of um, flutter at the end of that. So it's not just that you sort of hold them down by force. To some degree, they have to be wise enough to know that they're deferring to people even wiser than themselves. They're supposed to not slavishly, but willingly defer to their intellectual betters. But, you know, what kind of dignity or intelligence is aimed at there among the masses? Stephen leaves that quite vague. More important to him is, is the deference. But there's still some, some element there. Anyway, Stephen's technocratic liberalism uh, had another enemy. And this is what we would today call libertarianism. Uh, like technocracy, this was not a word they had yet at the time. Stephen's elitism uh, comprised a defense not only of the officialdom of learned experts, but also of powerful and well-organized government. Stephen's defenses of a strong state ran up against, as he saw it, an expanding section of the intelligentsia which had erected for themselves, quote, a religious dogma of liberty. Stephen was, uh, on the other hand, contemptuous of what he called the great mass of speculative men who set themselves either to challenge the right of government to meddle with anything but police subjects, or to prove that in point of fact, it can never do so with advantage. So this idea of anything but police subjects, or only police, uh, police subjects, that is quite a pithy summation of modern libertarian, libertarianism, actually. The idea of the night watchman state. It's another way of saying that. These thinkers would leave quote, everyone indiscriminately to do what he likes. That was intolerable to Stephen. This outlook, its shame and scrumble, amounted to a mean and cowardly abdication of the elite's duty to the populace. The former was not to let each among the latter go astray, as he or she will, but instead to steer them in the right direction. Wise and good men, he said, ought to rule those who are foolish and bad. But worship of liberty entailed denying the wiser part of the community the pursuit of public welfare on a large scale. And that's what he saw himself as defending. Nor, and here again you can see his extreme directness, nor was there any need to be bashful about the fact that force would lie behind the elite's use of the law to set the country's trajectory. Coercion, he said, was an instrument for improving, for improving humanity no more suspect than any other. All that mattered was that compulsion be directed aright. So, unsurprisingly, given these proclamations, Fitzjames' favorite philosopher was Thomas Hobbes, who many of you will, will know, the great 17th century theorist of absolute sovereignty and the necessity of coercion. Equally unsurprisingly, uh, Stephen's impatience. Um, Stephen was, was impatient with utopian schemes prevalent in uh, the century's literature. You can find this, for example, in, in Marx, or at least Marx in some of his moods, which foretold the withering away of the state and the disappearance of coercive power. Against, quote, the infantine satisfaction which things as they are going to be, oops, um, with things as they are going to be, Stephen enunciated something like a law of the conservation of coercion. The historical record, he argued, revealed no decline in the relevance of coercion to political life, nor did it support the thesis that coercion was more necessary to backward states of society, as Mill called them in On Liberty, than to advanced modern states. To quote again, President Lincoln attained his objects by the use of a degree of force which would have crushed Charlemagne uh, and his peers like so many eggshells. No great improvement. The spread of Christianity, the Reformation, the French Revolution, these were some on which Stephen spent a lot of time. None of these had been accomplished and consolidated without enormous force. So Stephen's outbursts at John Stuart Mill uh, were largely driven by his sense that Mill had offered aid and comfort to a pathological libertarian streak in the national culture. In terms of policy, Mill was not a libertarian. 
But Stephen thought Mill avoided being, uh, being so only by ignoring the clear implications of his own, of his own uh, theory. For Mill's On Liberty, as again many of you will, will know if you read it, Mill's On Liberty famously defended the very simple principle that society was justified in interfering with individuals only to prevent harm to others. But state action, even the most uh, innocuous sort like repairing infrastructure, is funded by taxes. And is not taxation interference, said Stephen. And indeed, <coughs> a very invasive form. To quote Stephen, to force an unwilling person to contribute to the support of the British Museum is as distinct a violation of Mr. Mill's principle as religious persecution. The difference between paying a single shilling of public money to a single school in which any opinion is taught, of which any single taxpayer disapproves, he continued, and the maintenance of the Spanish Inquisition is just a matter of degree. Consequently, on liberty fed into an attack on all government, whatever. So for Stephen, what a lot of people still assign as a sacred text of liberalism was simply a recipe for anarchy. And that's why he attacked it so forthrightly. So, uh, to continue a little bit more here. Today, especially for Americans, uh, I think, liberalism is associated with the separation of church and state. But in mid-19th century Britain, institutional liberalism was divided on this matter. Not everyone fought that. And Stephen sided with those who defended church establishments. Importantly, he remained uh, a, de a defender of church establishments even as he lost his own religious faith. And he did so because he placed such a high value on the visible way in which the existence of a state church sent the message that there was no fixed limit to government action. A religious uh, establishment was a potent symbol that, as Edmund Burke put it, quote, the state ought not to be considered as nothing better than a partnership agreement in a trade of pepper and coffee, calico or tobacco, or some other such low concern, but was rather a partnership in every virtue and in all perfection. That's uh, Burke there. Stephen's way of putting it was as follows. The division between church and state, the maximum of a free church and a free state, will mean that men in their political path capacity are to have no opinions upon the topics which interest them most deeply. And on the <coughs> other hand, that men of a speculative turn are never to try to reduce their speculations to practice on a large scale by making or attempting to make them the basis of legislation. Insofar as this principle is accepted, he continued, the state will be degraded and reduced to mere police functions. Again, the horror of utilitarianism, or of libertarianism there for him. Making matters worse, he said, a state degraded in this way would leave individuals prey to the illiberal pressures that powerful associations could exert. By attacking the state and diminishing its range of uh, activity, misguided liberals softened the ground for their enemies, he claimed. This is a characteristic quote of his. Associations of various kinds will take its place and push it to one side, and completely new forms of society may be the result. Mormonism is one illustration of this. Europeans at the time were very interested in you know, the phenomenon of Mormonism, which also makes an appearance in On Liberty. You read that. Uh, but the strong tendency which has shown itself on many occasions, both in, both in France and America, on the part of enthusiastic persons to try experiments in living by erecting some entirely new form of society has supplied many minor illustrations of this principle. San Simonianism, families of love, these were, well, San Simonianism was a weird uh, socialist religious movement in the 19th century, and uh, families of love had been this Anabaptist sect uh, earlier in the Reformation. Anyway, the point is these are just kind of exotic um, associations, groups that come about, he thinks in the absence of a strong enough state. Anyway, he says, uh, Sansimonianism, families of love, by whatever name they are called, are straws showing the set of a wind which someday or other might take rank among the fiercest of storms. Such experiments have nothing whatever to do with liberty. They are embryo governments, little states, which in course of time may well come to be dangerous antagonists of the old one. So if radicals assailed the uh, prerogatives of government for the sake of staying neutral on the greatest questions and thereby expanding the citizens' sphere of liberty, the vacuum, Stephen claimed, would be filled by private organizations that were not wary about pushing a positive moral vision 
either by means of intimidation and oppression. What was needed instead, he claimed, was for the best and the brightest to own up to the fact that it was, quote, simply impossible that legislation should be really neutral, and to admit that governments, as he said, ought to take the responsibility of acting upon such principles, religious, political, and moral, as they may from time to time regard as most likely to be true. The only route to any liberty worth speaking of, let alone to more primordial goods like uh, orders and public safety, classic Hobbesian goods, uh, involved ignoring liberty fanatics. This is one of his basic messages. As he put it in another passage, which I'll put up, which is quite sorry, uh, also illustrates this point of view. And what's notable to us is that this passage is actually sparked by his detestation of boycotting which is a term that had just been coined uh, in these exact years, um, as a way of describing the organized and often violent direct action by Irish radicals. So boycotting, has, anyway, this is an essay called, I can't remember exactly, On the Phenomenon of Boycotting or something like that, On the Suppression of Boycotting. And boycotting has, uh, as I say, just been coined. We now take this word for granted. Anyway, Stephen says, liberty is usually regarded as good and oppression is bad. But it is not till after the formation of a reasonably good system of government that it is possible to give any intelligible definitions of liberty and oppression. The only meaning which can be given to the word liberty taken absolutely is the absence of all restraints whatever on any of the passions and inclinations of men. This is a description of unbridled anarchy involving the destruction of all that makes life worth having. If, therefore, liberty is to be spoken of as a blessing an object of rational desire, uh, where, uh, da, da, da. Yeah, it must mean absence from all artificial uh, interferences with speech or action of any kind, except those imposed by a system of such laws as are above shortly described. But this cannot exist if other powers besides the law impose artificial restraints on conduct. Liberty considered as a blessing thus presupposes an established government a system of coercive laws which preserves each man from the oppressions which others might otherwise exercise upon him. It seems to me to follow that every man who has the smallest regard for the reasonable liberty of himself and his neighbors, the least appreciation of the benefits of a well-organized society, and of the infinite miseries of anarchy, in a word, every reasonable man and good citizen ought to feel in the strongest way that there should be no law but law that the established authorities should be its prophets, and that the usurpation of the functions of government should be recognized in their true light as acts of social war. So, we can dwell a little bit on what all that passage says. It's quite, quite a mouthful. But the basic point is, again, that like all other social goods, any liberty worth valuing is dependent on the establishment, the prior establishment, of what he called a powerful, well-organized, and intelligent government. Educated people directing the apparatus of coercion according to the best evidence and with the insight of specialists, anything but this, he claimed, was just reactionary idiocy or uh, the anarchy of the state of nature. All right, I'll pick it up a little bit here, but there are a few more points I want to. That's the basis of Stevens' elitism, you might say, and of his uh, anti-libertarianism. Now, one of the things that's quite interesting is that Stephen was unafraid to connect this ideal of strong technocracy to imperial rule. His commitment to the empire hardens his opposition to libertarians and democratizers, and it did so for two main reasons. First, he claimed, those who supported the empire abroad but were sympathetic to liberty, equality, and fraternity at home uh, had to give an account of why the two spheres, domestic and imperial, should be regulated on such different principles. The answer commonly given, including by Mill himself, was to delineate a threshold of societal development above which coercion only to prevent the individual from harming others was admissible, but below which civilizing despotism by a foreign power was thought appropriate. Primitive peoples, as they called it, um, primitive peoples unfit for public deliberation and the rule of law fell below the line, no claim, but advanced societies like Britain were above. This is the, some of the infamous passages at the start of On Liberty, if you've read it, where Mill says, nothing I'm about to say on liberty means I'm not in favor of the British Empire. 
Stephen rejected this attempt to draw a boundary between the faraway lands of the empire on the one hand and the metropole and places like it on the other. If it was right for the British, being more highly developed, to, quote, rule over the Hindus, why then may not educated men coerce the ignorant at home? What is there in the character of a very commonplace ignorant peasant or petty shopkeeper in these days which makes him a less fit subject for coercion on Mr. Mill's principle? So long as the upper classes remain wiser than the general population, the British Constitution ought, he claimed, to approximate the imperial government of India. An assertive technocracy, which Stephen defined as the essence of liberalism, was itself a kind of domestic imperialism and was justified because of that similarity. Imperialists who were democratizers or libertarians in the mother country were thus engaged, he claimed, in an incoherent enterprise. They were cutting the rug out from under their nation's greatest glory, uh, its empire, for there was no way to embrace the revolutionary credo at home without it spreading beyond the British Isles. Stephen's anti-democratic and pro-imperial tendencies were joined in another interesting way. And even though I had a lot, uh, quite a bit more written, I think I'll just end here, because I've gone longer than I expected. Anyway, Stephen's anti-democratic and pro-imperial tendencies were joined in another way. Part and parcel of the demos' political incapacity, he claimed, was that he could not appreciate the imperial project. Lacking material security, short-sighted, concerned only with what they could see would benefit them in the, in the near term. Once the masses came to power, once democracy occurred, the uh, empire would be unwound. This is what Stephen feared. <coughs> to appreciate how the empire contributed to England's reputation and security, or how it elevated, Stephen thought, those who were under its rule, was beyond the grasp of a democratic electorate. Anything like an adequate conception of the empire, he wrote, uh, and the great part which England has to play in the world was simply beyond the workers and the <coughs> bourgeoisie. Stephen was especially scornful of shopkeepers, whom democracy would make the predominant political force. These demographics would see governing India firmly and wisely, as he uh, wanted to do, merely as a drain on their pocketbooks. He called this a mean and liberal outlook that would not permit the new democracy to care about expanding the welfare of alien-seeming peoples halfway around the world. So Stephen was, was petrified that the populace would overturn the liberal imperial order that he believed was improving the life chances of millions and extending law and justice to new regions of the world. And uh, so yeah, as I said, I uh, was going to say a bit about what Stephen thought about free speech, but I think I'll just end there. What you have at the least is something of the taste for this figure who uh, is a liberal, you know, he stands for the liberal party. He's also um, openly and virulently anti-democratic and openly and virulently pro-imperial. And I think that's just a kind of interesting, uh, you know, interesting sequence of views um, to think about in the context of uh, our own crisis of liberalism, as some call it, and in light of some of the more uh, stark critiques of liberalism that you see nowadays coming from certain quarters. So I'll just uh, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Time for Q and A. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and I'll bring this this little mic to you. <coughs> Thanks, Greg. Um, I think I just have two questions. Um, one is just very simple. Uh, what, according to Stephen, the knowers ought to rule. Um, what do the knowers know exactly, according to him? It wasn't entirely clear to me. Um, I mean, two, two options immediately present themselves. The knowers could know um, what's good and just and that would lend them authority, or they could know abstruse technical matters of mm -hmm. some sort or other. Mm -hmm. um, so when he speaks of moral intellectual authority, mm -hmm. what exactly is the content mm -hmm. of that? Um, 
So that's my first just kind of simple question. The second one is a bit <coughs> more complicated. Um, I was wondering how consistent Stephen is in maintaining his principle that the, the knowers or the experts ought to rule. Um, two things you said stood out to me, and I know nothing of Stephen, so um, I don't know how, how if, if I'm on the mark here, but the first, one of these early passages you put up uh, in which Stephen qualified uh, the principle of expert rule on the grounds that the people should obey not slavishly but mm -hmm. willingly. Mm -hmm. That's pretty remarkable because, you know, that's to say that experts, knowers, shouldn't simply rule absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's to say knowers shouldn't rule in all cases. Mm -hmm. um, listen to your doctor. Um, he knows best. You're not a doctor. Um, but if you add you need to do so willingly, mm -hmm. you start backsliding into consent and maybe even into yep. anarchism. Mm -hmm. um, and so that leads me to the other observation I, I made just in the course of your talk. The Stevens' resistance to uh, taxes, or at least his insight into the fact that even taxes mm -hmm. constitute a kind of interference, mm -hmm. I, would have, I was really struck by that because I would have thought that somebody who believes that the experts or the knowers ought to rule, they should be entitled to impose on the people whatever constraints they deem necessary to achieve their rational ends. Mm -hmm. um, so that seemed to be a, to, to suggest that he really does maybe on some level backslide away from his principle that the experts ought to rule in the direction of the um, anarchic principles of Mill and the like? Okay, yeah, great question. Well, I think on the last, if we work backwards, interference is not a negatively loaded term for him. So it doesn't break the purpose of backsliding. As he says, he had coercion is not a negatively loaded term for him. The entire question is, is it directed to the right ends? And have you chosen appropriate means? So interference, I think, is not indicative of any kind of backsliding race. And in fact, the point of those passages is that they're absolutely right to interfere. Okay. If the elite actually is an elite, then it's their, indeed their moral duty not to just say, well, everybody's autonomous, let them do what they wish. No, it's their moral duty to give the people the benefit. So could they, they could do knowledge. that you know, no matter how um, <coughs> resistant the people are to yeah. the benefits. Yeah. Now, they are, this is, but your point is a very good one, and you're driving at something that's just quite I think difficult to answer in strict philosophical terms. Partly because, you know, he wasn't he wasn't a, a Hobbes or a Locke, but also because this is kind of the character of liberalism in that time. Right? So, you know, that passage that you mentioned, uh, not slavishly but willingly, um, note that he says this is this is a, a it may not be entirely fair here from what I'm putting up, but is the highest function gives you some idea. This is the idea. Mm -hmm. right. But obviously, he's willing to defend the British Empire, and he thinks that's grounded entirely in force and still justified. But ideally, right, the populace knows who its betters are. Right? And, and uh, in a sense, consents to their rule, though not, um, again, consent implying anything like democratic participation. So you might think, you know, if, if any of you have read. John Rawls, um, you know, he talks about the idea of a sort of a decent consultation hierarchy, which he said liberals could accept. That's not democracy. It might mean there's not actually any way for you to really eject your rulers, but in a sense, there's enough space for, you know, the classes aren't so divided. There's a way in which the needs of the people can be articulated and taken up. People have a sense that those above them are right to be above them. Uh, that they've earned it in some respect, they demonstrate a fitness for it. And Rawls says that could be a kind of decent society, one that liberals should respect. And I think that's actually a lot of what Stephen is getting at here. You know, the idea that there is, um, you know, ideally, technocracy for Stephen would not involve like constantly stamping the boot in something. Now, getting all the way to your question about what do the knowers know, so part of it, you know, I, 
your point about kind of do they know, um, you know, do they have the correct values or are they just technical experts? Um, the answer is that Stephen definitely waffles. Now, one thing I was going to get to is that he doesn't think he actually has a kind of a existentialism about him when it comes to values. All right, so, and it is for this reason that even as he's against democracy, he's very much in favor of freedom of speech because he believes that value conflicts need to be played out openly. And that indeed one of the great achievements of the Hobbesian state is to permit free speech because intolerance is a kind of natural impulse we have. People want to go to war against those who disagree with them and you need an incredibly strong state to suppress that and instead allow value conflicts to play out via dialogue. Uh, and not the uh, kind of just warfare. So, um, you know, that's, uh, and, and indeed he has a kind of belligerent warlike side that uh, you might, or agonistic side, you might say, that indeed sees that as very good that this is the way value conflicts play out and thinks that if we just agreed on everything, life would almost not be worth living. Let me see if I find the exact uh, passage. <laughs> Yeah, let's see. As he says, yes, struggles, struggles in different shapes are inseparable from life itself so long as men are interested in one of those <coughs> proceedings. Um, and here's even a better, uh, a better statement of it. He says, when Hobbes taught the state of nature is a state of war, he threw an unpopular truth into a shape liable to be misunderstood. But can anyone seriously doubt that war and conflict are inevitable except at the price of evils which are even worse? That is to say, at the price of absolute submission to all existing institutions, good or bad, or absolute want of resistance to all proposed changes, wise or foolish. Struggles there must always be unless men, men stick like lipids or spin like weather pots, like weather beds. Right? So it's something intrinsic to the human spirit in any reasonably free society that you actually have contests over values. And indeed, he's, that, that's, that's entirely fine. On the other hand, Stephen does, which to your point, would seem to suggest that what's valuable about the kind of experts he wants is just whatever the ends are that we wind up determining on somehow in the society, they're the ones who know can adopt the right technical means to implement it. But alas, even that's not really so easy. I mean, Stephen clearly thinks that uh, there are a certain set of moral judgments which, and policy preferences which the elite have uh, that the non-elite are not likely to have. And part of the elite's claim to rule is that they know those things. So one of them would be free speech and religious toleration, which he sees entirely as uh, an elite achievement against mass forces of intolerance. Another, as is typical of liberals of his time, is the protection of private property. And so he fears that masses will be very socialistic, and socialism is incorrect. And uh, a third, as I gestured to in the talk, is about the empire. Right? He just thinks most people are, are penny pinching. They're not going to see the benefits. They don't actually care about the glory of the country and about all of this good they're doing abroad. Right? They just want cheap government at home. They don't understand why we do this. And so there are clear ways in which he actually does, you know, he actually does believe that the liberal elite at this time has the right values. So I would say it's a kind of unclear mix, mismatch, you know, mishmash of those two domains that he sees kind of justifying, uh, justifying elite rule. One other thing just to, to put in the background of all of that um, is that uh, it's important to know that when he's writing, England is incredibly behind in public education. So they don't even have the beginnings of compulsory public elementary school until the 1870s. This is not like America. So there are extremely high rates of illiteracy. So this is also part of what's in the background of his terror of the mass, uh, which is also there in much more, as we might think, democratically liberals. Like Mill, who similarly, is, um, you know, Mill is thought of as the great liberal, but he also said, I actually don't really want universal suffrage. Not right now. It's, you know, too frightening. They don't know what they're doing. Education has to precede universal suffrage. And did this interesting song and dance about 
how you can get some popular participation. Mill wanted more of it than Stephen did. But they're both still in this loose game where you want to protect liberal freedoms and you want some amount of broad, uh, you know, broad buy-in to the political system. That's what makes your society a representative government. But on the other hand, they are, are afraid of the rise of mass society. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to hog the time, um, but I am the ruler, um, <laughs> if not the knower. Uh, so just, what, just, but this new passage was just very interesting. You said that he was a Habesian. Um, he admired Hobbes greatly, and and this passage though is sort of interesting because it suggests that he, at least based on this passage alone, he deviates from Hobbes in an important way or two. Um, would Hobbes say that there are evils worse than war and conflict? That is worse than violent death. The violent death you'd suffer in the course of war and conflict. Mm -hmm. Hobbes looked forward to peace, um, and he did look forward, I think, to an end of war based on difference of opinion mm -hmm. and glory um, or vainglory. So, would you say it just mm -hmm. does Stephen not? Look forward to peace. No, I think Stephen does. The war here is being quite, I think, quite, quite exaggerated. Um, but you know what he, um, I think you're right that what he does is, and this is actually kind of a popular move, and not without some ideas, you know, some basis in Hobbes. Right, is that he he liberalizes Hobbes in a way. What he wants to say is, look, from out of Hobbes we get a statism that's actually fit for liberalism. And what he's drawing on here is. The dominant understanding of Hobbes at the time, which was that Hobbes, um, Hobbes was what was called an Erastian, um, still a term you sometimes hear now, but not as familiar. Which was just to say that he asserted the predominance of the state over the church. Okay, and why did Hobbes do that? Well, if you read all the way to the end of Leviathan and other things in his life, it's because Hobbes thought that the church was incredibly intolerant. The only way to break the intolerance of the church was through an incredibly powerful state. And Hobbes hoped that his Leviathan state would in fact permit toleration. Not unlimited, but a considerable degree of toleration. And so you have there the idea, of course Hobbes, you don't have a right to toleration in Hobbes, you know, we shouldn't take this too far. Hobbes does think, as you're perfectly right to say, that um, civil war is the worst of all conceivable ends. Hobbes says sovereignty includes absolutely the right to control the space of opinion. And Stephen sort of, you know, sort of agrees with all of that, but then says, yeah, but that's consistent with, with liberalism. I mean, yeah, of course Hobbes was right that without this massive reservoir of sovereignty, people will just be tearing one another apart. But the magic of a liberal society is that you can have a state that's able, in a way, at least from certain perspectives, to permit Disagreements with it. Once everyone understands the state, you know, this is the idea of the bias, it stands way above all of them. And so Hobbes hopes that, you know, what you can get out of, or Stephen hopes that what you can get out of Hobbes is actually a recipe for how people who don't necessarily like each other can play out their struggles mm -hmm. in a way that's consistent with civil peace. Um, so, you know, for him, Hobbes is, I think, the great, the great liberal philosopher for Stephen, more than Locke, um, whom Stephen had a lot of criticisms of, actually, uh, because he thought Locke just sort of stipulated um, out of thin air that religious toleration was required, uh, and that a certain version of uh, separation of church and state was just demanded by justice itself. And Stephen didn't think that was an appropriate way to proceed. Uh, Hobbes, on the other hand, he thought, uh, had shown, in fact, a way in which people um, who might come to diverse judgments could live together under the idea of, you know, underneath a, uh, you know, the, the Leviathan, so long as the Leviathan stood over all of them. So, yeah, it's a great, great question. But you're certainly right that this is not, uh, you know, not an orthodox take on Hobbes, at least not as we would usually see Hobbes' theory. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your informative uh, talk. I, I didn't know anything about Stephen, and I found it quite interesting because 
I'm interested in these we might call aristocratic liberals. Mm -hmm. uh, he reminds me a little bit of Guizot mm -hmm. in France. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting as you were talking, it seemed like especially the slide where you talk about the, his critique of, of Mill and the experiments of living. Mm -hmm. Um, usually we would think of that as being, you know, today much more radical experiments in living, but he's talking about, you know, Mormonism and uh, uh, Semitism and uh, a lot of other uh, experiments in societies. But some people might say, well, actually, that's maybe one of the great strengths of liberalism is that it allows for that. I mean, we allow for uh, um, Mormons to, to exist. We allow for, uh, you know, Mennonites and Amish people to exist. And where you don't have that in Europe and in other places, mm. um, because there is this decentralization um, in the separation mm -hmm. between church and state, and so it almost seems like Stephen got it wrong. In mm. some ways, he, he keeps the liberal framework, um, but he's you know he sees this river coming as you, as you gave the example, but he tries to sort of build a little dike, but it ends up being swept away, and in some ways it's sort of useless because. He, what he should have done is sort of accepted what democracy would bring mm -hmm. um, and accept the separation between church and state um, and, the, and accept the decentralization. Um, but instead, he, he wants to centralize and he wants mm -hmm. to be a technocrat. And those seem to be the, the worst aspects of liberalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, your point about Mormonism, though, Mormonism was not accepted. Why did they end up in Utah? Because yeah. they were violent and they run out of many, many states. Right? Which, that's why Mormonism appears in On Liberty. Because Mill actually says, what are you doing? Stop attacking these people, right, in America. It's really, and Mill says an interesting thing, which is, no one has the right to force other people to be civilized. He said, which is a crazy thing for Mill to have said, because he actually believed that in the context of the empire, right? And, but that's what he says about Mormon. Mormonism was not accepted in America, right? Why don't Mormons want to put it? They didn't get put. We forced them to stop practicing certain aspects of their faith as they wanted to, and indeed chase them across the country, killing them. That's what happened. Um, and, you know, Mormonism was seen as a radical attack on um, Western civilization itself, you might say, and when, it, when it arose. Um, challenging, you know, basic ideas about sex, about the truth of the Gospels, uh, about morality, and so, you know, I would contest that these are really, um, you know, that these are just m minor things that we know, you know. One thing Stephen might say back to you is, well, of course you tolerate it now, but that's only because you won. You tolerate this light, pitiful version, right? Um, of course nobody would be against something that produced Mitt Romney, Stephen might say, <laughs> but Joseph Smith was not Mitt Romney, right? I mean, not really. That's, so that's one thing he could say back. Um, but I think the other point is that you're just, you know, you're just right about Stevens, in a way, um, you know, kind of, Steve, Stephen wants to say, in this, a vein that strikes me as almost proto, proto um, you know, that there are these, um, you know, that, that it's all right that there be deep difference in your society. So here's a good quote that I was going to get to, uh, that did, where he says, you know, um, and he, he hates all to talk about you know, civility, we've all got to like one another, he called that social Quakerism. Um, he says, for example, take on the one side a Roman Catholic priest passionately eager for the conversion of heretics, and on the other a person who has long since made up his mind against the Roman Catholic religion. The priest's love to the heretic, if he happened to love him, would be a positive nuisance. The priest society would be no pleasure to the heretic, and that which the priest would regard as the heretic's happiness the heretic would regard uh, as misery. And so, you know, this is part of, in the book, uh, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, which I quoted, this comes as part of his attack on fraternity as an ideal. Right? He says, fraternity is completely inconsistent with the value of liberty. Because one of the most basic parts of liberty is the liberty to hate other people, right? I mean, what is liberty? If it's not liberty to say, get away from me, I don't want anything to do with you. But uh, so that, I think, in a way, goes to this point about deep. Shouldn't that, in a way, as you said, point to uh, the value of decentralization and federalism, very broadly speaking? Give people as many different communities as they can be uh, involved in, and not try to force anything upon others. And I think Stephen just disagreed that that's, that's really what happened, you know? Um, 
Again, you want, uh, you want all kinds of difference, but so long, he thought, as they were to some degree tamed. And his point about the state church is one that you find in a lot of people going all the way back to Hume also. You know, Hume had said, I'm in favor of the state church. This seems like a crazy thing, because Hume's an atheist. He says, as an atheist, I'm in favor of the state church, because what does the state church do? It helps to mellow everything out. Where you don't have the state church, you have religious entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurship, which means you have enthusiasm and zealots. <laughs> and those people come after you. Not just your regular Church of England, you know, Church of England clergyman who's been bought off by a nice parish. Right? Like, man, I think Stephen just thought there are all kinds of aspects of what we would call civil society that are incredibly intolerant, right? And incredibly assertive and will become violent if you don't know that there's a kind of state that sets certain balance to what you're able to do. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, I think, me trying to ventriloquize his response in a way, which is not that, um, you know, he would, I think, you know, disagree in all cases with what you might see as the decentralizing and liberty-granting aspects of liberalism. But he would just say that those are secondary. Those come after you've established order, sovereignty, and so on, and they're to a large degree prudential judgments. I mean, you figure out how much you can tolerate in different places, you know, which groups are likely to step on others' toes and to make life unbearable. And the only people who can do that are a kind of intelligent elite backed by um, central government. But I think that's a really good question for bringing out the extraordinary, extraordinarily non-American uh, Stephen, Stephen's uh, liberalism. Um, and just real quickly on this point about aristocratic liberalism. Yeah, it's an interesting, he is like, um, I think is very similar to what um, Alan Cahan and others call the aristocratic liberals. Uh, but I, I think that at least for him and for a lot of people of his ilk, it's a little bit of a misnomer, right? Because the aristocracy for them did not just mean, you know, uh, it, it was the loose thing, you know? It didn't just mean people with privilege in the very vast way we now understand. It, they still lived in a time of actual aristocracy, and Stephen was not an aristocrat. He was, he was a member of the professional classes. That was core to his being, you know? For them, uh, I think, Liberalism was kind of, you might say, the ideology or worldview of the rising professional classes of the bourgeoisie. And it was against more radical ideas of democracy and socialism, on the one hand, but it was also against Toryism, which was a, a, a competing ideology of the landed aristocracy, you know, of the old sort of, um, the old hierarchies, which Stephen at least thought he was not kind of a part of. So, anyway, great, great question. Other questions? Oh, well, was 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 um, Stephen reflective uh, about his motivations as a public spirited mm -hmm. uh, uh, ruler or participant in? Uh, in ruling, and, and if he was, I'm curious what his reflections on that were, especially given the very low, one might say contemptuous view uh, he held of the ruled, and of the best that the ruled ever could be. I mean, is this like, well, there are a, a wise few, and we're living in a terrible madhouse, and we've got to corral these people to make sure they don't kill us, and then the question would be, so that they can do what? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, that, that's a pretty, if that's, what ru if that's what ruling is, then it's a kind of necessary evil. But it seems to me that he, he comes across, and I know him only based on this talk, as a rather kind of high-minded, mm -hmm. devoted, um, public-spirited uh, ruler who doesn't look, who, you know, doesn't look at it uh, as a kind of unfortunate um, Necessity. And so, what's the what's the case for 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 bothering yourself with all of these morons and yahoos and trying to get them to do, live uh, somewhat sensibly, contrary to all of their you know 
all of their inclinations. Good, good. Um, so, yeah, just an interesting one, one thing, kind of by way of responding to that you made. You know, his incredibly low view. It's certainly true. Um, interestingly, when you, if you read the book, if you've read On Liberty, right, um, Mill, something's often pointed out about On Liberty. Mill seems to have an incredibly exalted view of human possibility and an incredibly low view of all the people actually around him, who he says are just intolerant, custom ridden, uh, they suffer from the yoke of public opinion, they're mediocre, they drag everyone down, they don't have an appreciation for freedom and greatness. Interestingly, Stephen had a weird, when Stephen wrote against Mill, he really defended the average English countryman, who he said was not nearly so bad as Mill portrayed him. Right, is basically a sensible, decent, you know, hardworking, good person, and um, so any, you know, his. Uh, as I mentioned, he wrote a thousand articles just for one outlet called the Pall Mall Gazette in eight years. So he's not always as um, sort of negative in his portrayal of the people as I I put here. He's a little bit like if you've ever read Walter Badger. Some of you may know because he's cited at the opening of The Crown. That's how uh, Queen Elizabeth, when she's not yet the queen, is learning what the monarchy does. She's still being taught from Walter Badgett's English Constitution. You know what? Very similar idea, which is in a way, yes, the, people, the English people are great, but so long as they don't actually have the power. Once they get politicized, once they're actually brought into, once they realize they're the dominant force in political life, once the force of their numbers can be brought to bear electorally, then they're not going to defer and make nice anymore, and you're going to see the full extent of you know, their kind of ignorance. Uh, and that is really what he's thinking about when he's writing these incredibly kind of mean-spirited and demeaning passages. On the point about the reflectedness, um, I think I would say, he, he would just say, you know, well, look, you can, uh, what, what, is the, what is the phrase? Um, like, you might not want anything to do with politics, but politics wants something to do with you. I mean, he just thinks, he's got a platonic view, I think, in a way, which is, yeah, you know, you might not want to do this. He could have been much richer had he just practiced at the bar in his life. But, um, you know, the best people to rule are those who are reluctant to do it, as um, Plato put it. And also, he had a strong sense of, of public spirit, and was a quite public-spirited intelligentsia. And why do you do it? Well, you do it so that the right things happen. You know, he was very devoted to particular causes. He was very devoted to free trade, which was, you know, a cause that had just been won in his lifetime after long, long periods of activism. He was devoted to the rule of law. Again, that seems, we tend to think of the rule of law and democracy as synonymous, but he didn't. You know, he believed in, um, you know, that basically England was coming out of a period, it's true, when if you look at the start of the 19th century, English law was in an absolutely horrific place. I mean, you still have the death penalty, I believe, for enormous numbers of offenses, like trespassing, you know? Um, completely arcane, nobody understood legal procedure, nobody could kind of vindicate their rights in court, only it's a total mess if you read, again, Bentham's, this is what gets Bentham into politics in the first place. The idea that this just totally archaic and quite cruel um, kind of set of regulations that have grown up that nobody understands. Well, this needs to be put in order and rationalized. And he believes very strongly uh, in that cause. He believes in the empire. He believes, again, in, in, in sort of private, private property and freedom of contract, um, and not in sort of socialism. So, and he believes set in, in, in toleration, which he thinks is quite a hard one achievement. Um, and all of those, he believes, are uh, at least plausibly threatened if people like him aren't in charge. So I think he is involved in politics throughout his life, um, you know, for the same reasons in a way that that Mill was, which is partly he was raised to it by his father and his family, and partly because he was just extremely committed to a certain platform winning out and believe that there was, you know, you couldn't expect that some of the other rising tides in society supported those things in the way, the way he did. Yeah, great, great question.
So Stephen and Mill both obviously, I mean, Mill obviously committed to libertarian, excuse me, utilitarian moral principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, Stephen is very obvious how he takes that away from a kind of laissez-faire yeah. uh, approach that you might. Mm -hmm. But you know, Mill, he also, you know, by later in life, even though he's famous, he's most famous for being a free market guy, for being yeah. uh, <clears throat> toleration and liberty, he ends up with advancing socialism, and he, he, as you alluded to, he, he said that smart, educated people votes should count more. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's really kind of epistocracy even more than yeah. A, yeah. a technocracy. Mm -hmm. And is that you think that which is actually closer to Stephen than, than we mm -hmm. we think, given that they're portrayed as, as mm -hmm. in conflict. You think that comes from their utilitarian starting point that they both share? <laughs> Or is there something else going on? Yeah, I mean, that's a very deep, deep question. I don't. Uh, does it come from. You know, so that's another great quote. I didn't mean, have time to get to. But um, anyway, the, um, it depends, I think, what you mean by come from. They do want. They, they, I think, are quite sincere in both trying to uh, trace all of their commitments back ultimately to a utilitarian. Both of them reject uh, any kind of natural rights theory on those grounds. They reject appeals to uh, kind of uh, you know to revelation. So those are you know in the in that general sense that they believe in uh, consequentialist justifications for public policy. They I think are both absolutely sincere and committed to utilitarianism. And as you point out, it's just the case that utilitarianism can go in different directions. You know, the most prominent utilitarian today, my colleague at Princeton, Peter Singer, thinks you should give away 90% of your money and be a vegan and all kinds of other things. And that those are just, that's what comes out of utilitarianism, right? So utilitarianism is a, a method of thinking about and of justifying uh, policy uh, and sort of moral, moral valuations. It doesn't itself stipulate you know, any one set of things that would depend on all kinds of intervening principles. You know, so if you if you have a consequentialist justification that says, uh, you know, that gives a very strong grounding for, uh, let's an yeah, like Stephen's talking about. You know, if you if you think the empire is actually improving human welfare, then you can justify it perfectly sincerely on utilitarian grounds. And if you don't, you won't. He'll become a kind of utilitarian anti-imperialist. Um, the uh, to your other part, of the, the question about Mill. I mean, it, it is you're definitely right that Mill had a um, you know how exactly to describe his shift towards the end of his life is difficult. But yeah, Mill had definitely was not just a an orthodox free market figure, especially by the end of his life, and he was extremely radical about two things, uh, about land and inheritance. So Mill, by the very end of his life, came close to the position uh, of just nationalizing the land. It came extremely close to it. And um, said that that was actually admissible in principle, because land is not like other forms of property. It's not grounded in your labor. Um, uh, and in fact, what he advocated was called um, taxation of the unearned income. So he had the idea that just in any, wherever there's economic growth, value of land goes up, wherever there's economic growth. Uh, you can see this if you live as I do in the New York area, where just no matter what you do, every year it gets more expensive to actually own something there. And Mill thought, well, people shouldn't be able to take that wealth for themselves. They didn't do anything for it. So what you do is you find a way, statistically, to um, distinguish the value of the land that's due to the improvements the landowner has actually made on it, the investments they've made, versus the value of the land going up simply as a product of factors beyond their control, and you just take all of that latter value and give it to the state, right, to then redistribute as you wish. The other area where he was very radical was on inheritance. Mill believed that um, he wasn't all the way to confiscatory inheritance taxes, but he was close. 
He said people should only be able to inherit up to a modest independence. So, you know, you could not leave millions and millions to your kid. I don't know what, what does that amount to now, a modest independence, who knows. But clearly it's not, um, he was against intergenerational wealth. Um, and in both of those, and uh, you know, I think he was extremely kind of radical left on economics by the end of his life. Stephen rejected both of those propositions completely. But they were one other area that is often said to be socialist in Mill. So Mill was a fan of cooperatives. So he thought, he hoped that basically the distinction between capital and labor within firms would give way to workers owning their own firms. And Stephen was actually hopeful about that. So that was actually not necessarily seen as a kind of crazy left view. That was seen as uh, a kind of optimistic liberal endpoint. So there are certainly people who call themselves socialists who favor cooperatives, no doubt. But there were also crusty liberals like Stephen, um, and even some liberal conservative thinkers who favored cooperatives. And the reason they did so is precisely because that seems like a market solution to the problems of inequality and market control. Cooperatives still compete in the market. Right? Nobody, that is not about the state taking money from A and giving it to B because the state just thinks it has to solve poverty or something, or um, which Stephen would have thought was impossible. Um, or, you know, doing that in pursuit of some uh, in a, you know, inefficient way of pursuing some end. They were both very, um, both Stephen and Mill were uh, liber economic liberals in the sense that they didn't trust in the state itself to solve the problem of poverty, and they thought competition was not growth in and of itself. And so, and that is consistent with, with uh, like cooperatives. So, yeah, great question. Yeah, uh, regarding imperialism, how does uh, Stephen see that as part of his liberalism or? Uh, another way to put the question would be like, what, what does he think is the purpose of uh, imperialist group for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for its colonies? Yeah, um, so uh, there's often, you know, there's what's called, uh, in, in French, it's called la mission civilatrice. Um, in, uh, you know, basically the idea of a civilizing mission, the reason that you have an empire is to raise up the subject people so that eventually they'll be able to govern themselves. That's kind of the, the, the true Mission Civilisatrice justification that someone like Mill would offer. In the end, the horizon is self-government for all peoples. But they are in such a state uh, of backwardness, as Mill would put it, that they need the strong hand of the Brits to get them going. That's how Mill would see it. Stephen did not see that as necessarily the horizon. He did not commit himself to the idea that, like Mill or Whigs like Macaulay would, that eventually India will go its own way. Britain is just there to raise them up, and in 50 years or 100 years or something, they'll be their own uh, great nation. Stephen is, let me just put it frankly, he is more racist, right? He doesn't necessarily, he doesn't want to commit himself to that being a possibility. He thinks maybe Britain will be there forever. Uh, but he does believe, and he says this, that the greatest gift of the British Empire is law. Bringing the, what, the English idea of law to uh, the peoples over which the empire rules. And so he, for him, the primary justification is not necessarily capital P progress, ultimately eventuating self-government that Mill has. It's bringing the rule of law to these countries. And doing it, you know, you're doing it by military force, you know, by occupation. But he still thinks that uh, you're bringing um, important legal uh, provisions of due process and uh, kind of notions of individual liberties, protection of contract, and all of that um, to uh, the areas over which you rule. And that's what he's, you know, he says that law is the greatest thing that England has to give the world. So that's his underlying justification, if you will, 
for what he thinks he's doing there. And as I think I mentioned, he comes to this weird position where he actually says that the state of the law is much better in India, even than it is in the homeland, because people like him have a free hand there. So he does, and actually a lot of Stevens' innovations are still a part of Indian law. Right? They didn't all go away. It's not the case that in India became independent, they just swept everything off the law books or anything like that. So Stephen worked especially on the law of evidence. So, um, you know, when you're brought up on some kind of charge, what rules govern your trial? How do we decide guilt or innocence? Stephen was obsessed with questions like that. And he thought that um, he had a great success there. And that, in fact, you were better off just being an average person in India than in Britain if you found yourself caught up in the web of the law somehow, because England having a common law system that had never been codified, set in order by good minds like himself, you were just you know, much more likely to be caught up in some total nonsense mess with no good way out. Um, so that's kind of you know, a strange strange feature of his, of his thought. Yeah, needless to say now, I mean, very few people accept Stephen's justification, um, or Mills for that. I think we'll conclude here, so please join me in thanking Professor Kati for his very interesting talk.